have a uh, word of prayer and get into a uh, lesson today. Father, Lord, I ask for wisdom. Give me spiritual discernment. Oh, Heavenly Father, show me what you're doing in this world right now. God, we pray, give us direction. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I claim that promise that you said, when the Spirit of truth has come, he'll guide us and do all truth. I pray for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is uh, I am going to uh, teach, speak about what I believe. And uh, this is not what the church believes. This is what I believe. And, uh, you know, probably every church has its doctrinal statement. You can get online, get on Christian sites, and they'll have a doctrinal statement. What do they believe doctrinally? I'm going to tell you what I believe this morning, and uh, I have reasons for everything I believe. I didn't come to a lot of these beliefs overnight. It was a process of years and years of study. So uh, I want you to turn with me in First Peter chapter number 1. Verse 8, you'll find this over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, the word believe, emphasized in many different ways. The fact is, the Bible is unique in the sense that it will approach, it will approach a subject in many different ways. But in verse 8 it said, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All right, these are things that I believe. These are not preferences, and these uh, some of these things I wasn't even taught, but I do believe them. About the Scripture, about the Bible, if you've listened to me preach for any period of time, you'll know that I believe that Bible is the Word of God. When I say that Bible, I'm talking about the 1611 authorized version. I believe it is God's inspired Word. I believe it's inspired from cover to cover. For those that need this, and most of you don't, but for those that need this, I've had three years of Greek grammar and two years of Hebrew grammar. I've been through the classes. I'm not a Greek scholar and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but nobody's going to hoodoo me because I've had enough of the stuff to where I can handle a Greek lexicon, I can handle Greek in its raw form. So therefore, knowing all of that, I still believe the King James Bible is the Word of God from cover to cover, and I do not believe it has any errors in it. I believe that all these new Bibles, some of them are the attempt possibly by men who mean well, possibly. I'm not God. I'm not the judge of their motives. That's not my place. But I do believe by observation that the proliferation, and that's exactly what it is, of Bibles has done nothing but create confusion. It has not helped the body of Christ one bit. By observation, I've watched the new Bibles as they have produced a new form of Christianity, quote unquote, which is a laid back cavalier approach to God's Word, and they no longer take the Word of God as the absolute authority. They take their feelings and whatever spirit may be dealing with them at that time. And so, uh, this is the uh, this is what uh, this is the modern Christianity, and I believe that the new Bibles have had a lot to do with producing that. The day will come when I'll stand in judgment, and so will every translator of the Scriptures. All these new King, all these new English Bibles, they'll stand in judgment along with me. We'll stand before the God of the universe and give an account for what we've done in this life. I will have to give an account to God for believing that one book is His Word, and that I, when I open that book, I do not worry one bit about errors. I believe the Bible is God's infallible, inspired Word. And when I say the Bible, I'm not talking about inspired originals. That all sounds high and good in its place, but the truth of the matter is there's not a soul on the face of this earth that has ever seen an original, nor have they ever touched an original. It doesn't exist. If they exist, if the original writings of the apostles who wrote the New Testament exist, nobody knows where they are. If they are, and the big word for that is extant. If those texts are extant, 
We don't know it. They could be. There could be some originals buried in the sands over there in the Middle East somewhere. That's possible. But we don't have them. But what we do have in the English language is the Word of God. And I have checked out the so-called errors, haven't found them, so I believe the Bibles. So when I preach from it, I preach from it because I believe, I preach from it as if, if you've listened to me preach, I preach the authority of this book. This book has authority. And it takes no back seat, second place, bows to nobody's religion, nobody's book, nobody's faith, nobody's church, nobody's government. It bows to no king, no president, no parliament, no one. It is the book, the authority, thus saith the Lord. And I do not hear the man who appeal to the new translations preach like that. It is a compromising type message. It's a relevant type message. And uh, there's no power in that. And the Bible said when the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, He did not speak as the scribes and Pharisees. Amen. Never a man spake like this man, they said of Him. And the reason He did is because He believed that the Word of God, and the Word of God at His time, was Genesis through Malachi. He never appealed one time to the Jewish Apocrypha, any pseudepigraphic writings, any, any extra-biblical scriptures, nowhere in scripture, I shouldn't even use the word scripture, extra-biblical writings, he never appealed to them one time. The only book he ever quoted when he was here was the Old Testament scriptures that you have in your hands. Secondly, I believe that the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, is a representation of an eternal being that has existed from everlasting. Amen. There never was a time when he was not. Amen. I believe that the Old Testament is very, is very uh, mysterious about the essence and element of God, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost can all be found in the Old Testament Scriptures, yes, when you're looking for them. But on the other hand, if you are a Jew who lived at the time of Christ 2,000 years ago, and you had Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse number 4 that says, Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. One Lord. There is one God. One God. I'm a Trinitarian in the sense that I believe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost make up the Godhead. But I don't believe in three gods. And some Trinitarians verge on believing in three gods. They've got them all chopped up and separated to where they can categorize them and understand them. God is still a mystery. I believe that the Old Testament speaks very clearly of an eternal spirit being who no one has ever seen. That's God the Father. The Bible says in the New Testament, no man's seen God at any time. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. There is no way you even understand the essence of God because God is a spirit being and no one understands the essence of a spirit. It is not def he is not defined anywhere. All you have ever read about when it comes to the Almighty is a manifestation of Himself. In other words, how He makes Himself known for you to understand Him in your limited understanding. I believe the essence of God is so far above and beyond us that there's no way that we could even comprehend it until the Son opens up for us the essence of God the Father. I believe that God Almighty became a man 2,000 years ago. I believe firmly that most of the church does not have a clue about how important it is to preach the message of the God-man. It is the God-man that saves you. It is God who became incarnate in flesh. In 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, not he who. All the new Bibles have changed that to say he who was manifest in flesh. That is an insidious attack upon the manifestation of God in flesh, not only upon the deity of Jesus Christ, who is God himself, but an insidious attack upon the incarnation of God becoming flesh. It preaches good and sounds high and mighty where God robed himself in flesh, but that has nothing to do with reality. He did not put on flesh. He became flesh. But the flesh he became is not your flesh. The Bible teaches plainly that he took part of the same. If you get into a deeper study of the incarnation, you'll realize that when the Lord Jesus Christ was born, and well, let me say this, let me say it again. The Lord Jesus Christ was not born. The Lord Jesus Christ has always been. 
The God-man was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. A being came into existence that defies explanation and understanding. He is very God of very God. Somebody said, well, he's 100% man and he's 100% God. That all sounds good too. But if you'll look at it very carefully, you'll understand that you've made a mistake in saying that. How so? There is no way that the Lord Jesus Christ is 100% of what you are. Because you are a fallen creature. You were born with a fallen nature. You came to this world with the curse of Adam upon you. This is why the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is the second man. All men before him came of the first man. The Bible said the first man, Adam, was of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's the incarnation. The Lord Jesus Christ is also referred to as the last Adam. Being the last Adam, he therefore becomes the source of all future humanity. They must come forth from him. There is no life apart from him. Therefore, the subject matter of this Bible... There is nothing in this Bible that has any meaning at all if it does not relate to the God-man. The God-man is the burden of the New Testament church to preach. So what do I believe about the Godhead? I believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost was a mysterious being only understood in parts in the Old Testament, eternally existing but I believe 2,000 years ago, God manifested himself in a way that he never had before. He literally became man, became flesh. And by doing that, we begin to get an understanding now of God, and there's still much more to know about him. Still much, 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 much more. Much more. But you need to know the God-man. You need to know that, because without him, there is no salvation. He's not on a crucifix. He's not hanging on a wall. He's not a picture somewhere. He's a living being at the right hand of the Father. Third, salvation. This is what I believe about salvation. I believe that all men are lost without God and without hope. I believe they come into this world, as Paul said in Romans 5, as death passed upon man, upon every man, all born of Adam. They, can't, they received death, born into death. They were subject to death. And they were, they were literally born dead in that sense. They have no hope. They need to be saved. Salvation, therefore, is not a doctrine, it's not a verse, it's not, it's, it's not a message, it's not, a, it's not something you can print and attract, it's not something that you can take hold of and say, I've got it. Salvation is a person. Amen. Salvation is a person. Amen. Salvation is a person. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. You can believe all you want to believe about the Son, and that will not save you. You can accept until, until the Lord comes back all that everybody says about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That will not, that will not save you. You must accept the Son. Amen. By accepting the Son, you must understand who He is. You're accepting the God-man. For a man to deny that Jesus Christ is very God of very God and then turn around and tell me he's a Christian is the, is the height of, of, of insanity. You cannot deny His deity and say that you're born again. Salvation produces the new birth. The new birth is not something that you acquire through a lifetime of goodness. It's not something that comes upon you by keeping the commandments. The new birth is not given to you at birth. You're not some, nobody poured water on your head and made you a Christian. The new birth is not associated one bit with the church you belong to. The new birth has nothing to do with your status in life, your education, how much money you got in the bank. Your new birth, the new birth, the new birth is literally being born of God, born of the God-man. When he arose from the dead, he became the last Adam. By becoming the last Adam, by the resurrection from the dead, he has life in him that did not exist before. He said, as the Father hath life in himself, even so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. The new birth is the resurrected life of the God-man that is, that is literally, in, that's literally uh, you're born into when you are born again by the grace of God. This is why no Old Testament saint was born again, because there was no second, no last Adam, second man. Saved? Yes, they were saved, but not born again. You cannot be born again without, first of all, the death of the testator, the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and, brought the new, and, and ratified the New Testament, brought it into being. 
The New Testament is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the blood of the New Testament. It's the new covenant that he's brought man into. But until he died on the cross, buried and rose again the third day, being declared the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, there was no new birth. And so that's salvation. You must be born again. You might be the greatest man in your denomination, have all the accolades they can hang on you, every degree you can possibly carry around. Everybody call you father and bow before you. But you must be born again. I don't care who you are. You may be sitting in the Oval Office right now, and at the pinnacle of success, you must be born again. You may be the richest man in the world, more money in the bank than any man's ever thought of ever having, more than you could ever spend in a hundred lifetimes. You must be born again. What do I believe about the Holy Spirit? I reason I mention the Holy Spirit in a different context of the Godhead is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit a person? Yes, He's a person. He's not an influence. There are religions who teach the Holy Spirit as an influence, simply an influence, simply God sending forth His influence. The reason they do that is because they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. The problem with that is that uh, they go back to the Old Testament and declare that they are witnesses of Jehovah, but they have a problem with the Lord Jesus Christ. They teach that He was a created being. God, yes, they allow Him to be a God, so He was a created God. And now they've even come, they've even relented to the point to where they say he is, he created the, the, the heaven and the earth, but he was still created by God the Father. So he's still subservient. He's still a lesser God. <laughs> he goes back to the Plato and the uh, demiurge and the demigods, the steps of godhood to attain to godhood uh, one day and uh, teaching a pagan doctrine that's, over th that's almost 3,000 years old. The Holy Spirit is the manifestation of the Son of God in this world today by the Spirit of the living God bearing His resurrected life to mankind. That's who He is. And He's a person. Say this, He's, he, he's a being. He's here. The Holy Spirit's work in this world today is not to tell you about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work in this world today is to not to create a church that talks about the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in this world today is to point you to the God-man. And the way he does that, because he is the God-man resurrected from the dead in spirit. The Bible said, if the Spirit of Christ dwell not in you, you are no part of him. Him man, have not the Spirit of Christ, he's no part. He's none of his. So when the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ, that's a remarkable thing, don't you think? I believe that religion has... Has, has, has kind of pushed him out the door in the sense that men, uh, when they realize that there's nothing happening, they set about to, to uh, cause it to happen. So, they, so they, uh, men are good at organizing, they're good at uh, uh, orchestrating, they're good at building, and so what they do, they, since there's no power of the Holy Spirit present in the church, they set about to do it in another way. So they create a fleshly, entertaining, feel-good church, and that's what's happened to the church today. The reason the power of the Holy Spirit is not present in the church is because a number of reasons, mostly because Christ is not exalted. Men are exalted. But a lot of it has to do with the way people live, too. If you live a godless, uh, uh, reprobate life, don't expect the power of the Holy Spirit anywhere around you. He's not going to be there. He's not going to be there. He's not going to ordain that. He's not going to approve of that. So the power of the Holy Spirit is literally the lifeblood of the church of God. That's our lifeblood. The power of the Holy Spirit. Because when the power of the Holy Spirit is manifested in a church, in a group of people who come together. You see, folks, there's no difference between you sitting in here and those that are sitting over there at, uh, say, some, some lecture at the University of Tennessee tomorrow. There's no difference. Uh, let's say a board meeting takes place at IBM. And uh, you've, got a, you've got a couple of hundred people meet that board meeting. Say the stockholders meet with the Ford Motor Company. You know, you've got a bunch of people sitting in a room. What's the difference between them and you? None. There's no difference. Because all of you go out into the world, and some of you, uh, you, may be, you, may be, you may be bankers, you may be, uh, you may be mechanics, you may be doctors, you may be whatever you do. Uh, you know, that's what you do. But when you come together in here, that's not what you're coming in here for. That's not what you are. See, this is not a congregation of bankers. It's not a congregation of mechanics. It's not a congregation of truck drivers. It's a congregation of born-again believers. And when people, when people group together for that sole reason that they're born again and they want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and lift up His name, the Holy Ghost shows up. He shows up. He shows up. And when He shows up, power shows up. 
And when he shows up and power shows up, that's what differentiates you from any other meeting on the face of this earth. There is no, there is no comparison. It becomes the habitation of God by the Spirit. And that's the most wonderful thing in the world. That's our heritage. That's who we are. And that should be constantly held before the people. They should be constantly reminded. We didn't come in here for us. We came in here for him. Somebody said, well, why bother to meet? Because of him. That's why I'm here. Because he lives. Because if he wasn't alive, I wouldn't be alive either. I have no reason to live. Then the next one's eschatology. <laughs> That's a big word. It comes from the Greek word eschatos. It simply means last things. That's all it means, just last things. So the doctrine of eschatology is the doctrine of last things. Now, this is to uh, give you a simple classical definition of it. Uh, it has to do with, mostly with the coming of the Lord and with uh, a future kingdom and a possibly uh, what's called a tribulation period. And there's a lot of variance on that. You have three basic groups. You have premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. Premillennial simply means before the millennium. Amillennial negates it, takes it away, and says no millennium. Postmillennium says after the millennium. So that's the three basic groupings of it. But in that you have variance in all three because you have a tribulation period. You can be premillennial and mid-tribulation, or you can be premillennial and post-tribulation. And that tribulation, when you say premillennial, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation, or pre-tribulation, you're talking about the coming of the Lord. You're, coming about, you're talking about that thing that's called the mystery, where he said, he said, I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you to myself. It's called, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. It's the mystery revealed the Apostle Paul. And the reason the mystery was, it was, the, it was wait, they, God waited to reveal the mystery is because the mystery directly relates to the church. So first the church had to come into being, and then once the church came into being, God revealed the mystery to the Apostle Paul about what he's going to do with the church, the body of Christ. So that has to, do with the, uh, it has to do with the coming of the Lord, the doctrine of last things. Now when you go to the Old Testament, begin to study the doctrine of last things, it becomes very clear that the one thing that stood out time and time and time and time again in the Old Testament is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Especially when you get into, the, into what they call the minor prophets. I don't believe in such a thing, but the minor prophets like uh, Hosea and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and so forth and Micah, they talked about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And so uh, the day of the Lord is a time of darkness and wailing and moaning and gnashing of teeth. The day of the Lord is a time of destruction and darkness, a time of judgment. And the day of the Lord is a theme that runs all through the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. So when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, his disciples said they had that in their mind. That's what they were thinking about. And when they came to him in Matthew chapter number 24, said, uh, they said, uh, should we look for the kingdom? Is it time? Is it time to look for the kingdom? The day of the Lord? The coming of the Messiah? And then he said, well, that day, let me explain something to you about that day. He began to open up the doctrine that was way in the future for them. And they had a hard time to comprehend it. But it had to do with Israel. Here you are now, but Israel will be around 2,000 years from now. And it's called the budding of the fig tree. It's called the, he used a, he used a number of different uh, analogies to refer to a people that would be alive 2,000 years in the future. He started relating the coming of the Lord with Israel as a, as a people. Then when the Apostle Paul showed up, he began to reveal to these people how, now the day of the Lord is definitely something that's going to happen, but there's some, there's some things that accompany the day of the Lord. One thing in particular that precedes the day of the Lord is the coming of the Lord for his bride. He's going to come and get his bride. Well, if you talked about the bride of Christ in the Old Testament, they would have confused that with the wife of Jehovah. Because in the Old Testament, the wife of Jehovah was Israel. But in the New Testament, there is no wife of Jehovah per se. Israel still is. There's a bride of Christ. And he's going to come and get his bride. And who's the bride of Christ? Well, God revealed that mystery to Paul too. The mystery he revealed to the Apostle Paul was that the bride of Christ is the church of God. And the reason I use the term church of God is Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. That's the term it uses. And I guess I'm kind of, I'm kind of mean, too. If you don't know the truth about it, I still got a mean streak in me. I, I lash out at the Baptist briders all the time because the Baptist briders go around teaching that the Baptist church is the first church. And, you know, and they say that the Baptist church is the church. And they say John the Baptist was the first Baptist. That's junk. 
John the Baptist said he was a friend of the bride. He stood outside looking in. The law and the prophets were until John. But since that time, the kingdom of God has preached. Every man presseth into it. I'm a Baptist from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But I can fellowship with the church of God. I could fellowship with an assembly of God. I could fellowship with a with 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 uh, with, with Amish or a, a Mennonite or a, a anybody if they're born again. If they're born again, my uh, the criteria I base fellowship on is Jesus Christ. Our fellowship is in the Son. If you're going to have to, if listen, if the only fellowship you can have with somebody is people who baptize the way you bab, you know, in other words, a Baptist brighter, you have to be baptized by a a qualified baptizer into a qualified church for a qualified reason and so forth and so on. I mean, they build all this stuff. And then you have to be premillennial and you have to be, you have to believe all the things that they believe. Well, friend, you're, you've limited your, your fellowship to a small group. You've really, you've really reduced it quickly. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't hold to that. I, it's, it's, the Bible said to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, my church of God, brethren, those folks out there that call themselves the church of God, that's fine. I'm not mad at them. But they're not the only one. We're the church of God, too. So I guess some of why I say that's for them, too. It kind of makes them a little mad maybe when they hear this Baptist preacher refer to the church of God all the time. But the truth of the matter is, are you a member of the church of God? You better believe it. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say it's the Baptist church. It's never called the Methodist church. It's never called the Episcopalian, Lutheran. It's never referred to as that, but it is referred to as the church of God. You say it was referred to the Church of Christ. No, Churches of Christ in a generic sense, see. So, but it is the Church of God. So there is that streak in me, and you pray for me, because ask God to forgive me for it. <laughs> I, it, it. When I get a hold of something like that, like these infidels we've got here in Knoxville, talking about my Bible being full of myths and so forth, I, that, that stuck in my crawl real bad, and I'm not over it yet. So... Uh, I believe, here's what I believe since I went through all of that. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe a rapture was a mystery revealed the Apostle Paul. The rapture simply means the Lord's coming back to take his bride away. When's he going to take her away? That's the issue. Is he going to take her away before the, before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation? I've got brethren out there, and I consider them brethren, who believe it's the middle of the tribulation. Some of them believe it's the end of the tribulation. I believe it's before the tribulation. A good reading of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 will help you with that. The new Bibles, of course, changes it. The Bible says, let no man deceive you. The day of Christ is at hand for no man. What does it say in the new Bibles? It says, the day of the Lord is at hand. The new Bibles have completely turned that doctrine on its head and changed everything. They have no right to call it day of the Lord. If you look in the Greek text... A lot of folks just get so Greeky, that's all they can think about is Greek. There's two words to be concerned with. One is Christos, and the other is Kyrios. The word Christos, 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 is easy, isn't it? Christ. The word Kyrios is Lord. So the New Bibles have Kyrios. The King James Bible, which came from the majority text, has Christos. Why is that? That ought to raise a red flag. You ought to get to digging a little bit and say, why is it? Why do some Greek manuscripts have Christos and some have Kyrios? Because that completely changes the coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord's a profound thing, don't you think? It's a big deal for the Lord to come back. He said, I'll come again. Amen. And, you know, there ought to be a lot of reasons why someone would want to dig a little deeper. And so I'm, pre I'm pre tribulation. I believe in tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's Jacob's trouble. Hear you, O Israel. Jacob, thou worm Jacob. Jacob and Israel used interchangeably in the Old Testament. When God calls him Israel, he's the one he took from a dunghill and raised up. When he calls him Jacob, it's to pinpoint the fact that's the one I took from the dunghill. Take a good look at him, what I'm able to do when I transform him from one to another. So the time of Jacob's trouble is when God deals with Israel as he dealt with Jacob. The time of Jacob's trouble has to do with the fact, therefore, that God prepares Israel for the coming of their Messiah. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourned for his only son. He's not getting the church ready for the coming of the Lord. 
He's getting Israel ready for the coming of the Lord. And how many of you have noticed since 1948 the ascendancy of Israel? How many of you have noticed since we had this current president come into office how that the whole tenure and attitude of this uh, administration has changed toward Israel? There are very few people on this earth can be called ancient people. Very few. Very few. Folks, we are not, believe me. We're made up of everything. <laughs> there was no, there was, did not exist 500 years ago an American. Did not exist, okay? But Israel, the Jews, are ancient people. They've been around a long time. They were around a long time before the first president ever showed up. They'll be around a long time when the last one steps down from office. So the time of Jacob's trouble has to do with Israel. The nation and the world is turning against Israel. They're turning against them. So when I see the world and the nations turn against Israel, you know what that does to me? A wise man said a few, probably a couple of hundred years ago, he said, just go out and find which direction the world's headed, go in the opposite direction, and you're going to meet God somewhere. You're going to meet Him face to face. And that's good advice. It really is. It's good advice. And the world is against them. And the, the Zionists, you get, they'll wear you out with Zionists. They'll wear you out with the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. They'll wear you out with the, with the Rothschilds and the Jewish bankers. And there's an awful lot of truth in all of that. But the truth of the matter is, they are out there in unbelief right now. They've been blinded, and they're waiting for the coming of their Messiah. And if it hadn't have been for them, I wouldn't have a Bible. The Jews wrote the book. To them, the Bible said in the book of Romans, was given the oracles of God. So I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the tribulation time Jacob's trouble. I believe in a thousand-year reign on this earth, literal physical reign, the Son of God. I believe he's going to sit in Jerusalem and reign. I believe to the end of that thousand years, the devil who has been bound for that thousand years is going to be turned loose for a while. According to the book of Revelation, come up to deceive the nations again, and then the final conflagration. Because then the, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and wherein dwelleth righteousness. But before that, the great white throne judgment judges Satan, judges the Antichrist, judges all of them, turns them into hell fire, and then God makes a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be peace in it. The only way there will be peace is because there's righteousness. Here's a lesson that you have to learn. This is one of the lessons I wish I'd been taught this from day one. This is so very important. You hear peace, 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 peace movement, peace movement. They take, a, they take the cross and they break it downward, a broken cross pointing downward, and they call that the peace movement or the peace sign. That has nothing to do with peace. That's a piece of pagan garbage. But here, well, then when is peace coming? When righteousness comes. You cannot have peace without righteousness. I hope you understand that you live in a perilous time. And the first thing that defines the time of peril is that men shall be lovers of their own selves. And reverends are standing in the pulpits all over the world this morning and will be in just a few minutes, telling people that they need to love themselves. And that, if you'll look at the very heart and soul of why most marriages break up, you'll find out that the individual loved themselves more than they did their spouse and their children. So that's what I believe. Church polity, the word polity, has to do with the makeup, the organization, the ordinance of the church. What do you believe about it, preacher? I do not believe in a hierarchy. Amen. I believe in an autonomous, that means self-governing, church. I believe that it makes it much stronger. If you have a hierarchy, you corrupt the hierarchy, you corrupt the churches. If churches are answerable to a central, centralized location, then they are answerable to men between them and God. These men exercise control and authority that nowhere in the Bible does it give them. Within the first hundred years after Christ, in the apostolic church fathers, and the church fathers come in three groups, apostolic, anti-Nicene, post-Nicene. Council of Nicaea was a dividing line where they hammered out what Christians are supposed to believe. 
the apostolic church fathers in their writings began to lay down the foundation for a church hierarchy. That's where the Catholic Church gets all of its doctrine about the Pope and about all those underneath him. There is no church on this earth that has more hierarchy than the Catholic Church. The Greek Orthodox Church, which came from the Catholic Church, or let's just say this, they split in 1050 A.D., essentially built on the same principle. A Russian czar, a few years later, went shopping around to try to find a religion. He needed something for his people because they're pretty, they were pretty backward and pretty uh, 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 just beast. <laughs> uh, they are rough people. Uh, they had a hard life. And so one of the Russian czars says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to check around and find a religion for my people. He decided on Christianity. I don't know how that came about, but he decided that Christianity, he took it from the Greek Orthodox Church. You ever look at the Russian language, look at their alphabet, and you'll see a lot of the, of the letters of the, of the Russian alphabet came straight from Greek. And the Russian Orthodox Church came straight from the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, this is a little piece of tidbit news that just recently came out. How many of you heard what Mr. Putin did over there in uh, Russia in the last few days? Well, he has instituted a national holiday in Russia commemorating, and I think he's commemorating, if I remember correctly, he's commemorating the introduction of Christianity into Russia. Uh, yeah. And so what he's done has instituted a Christian holiday in Russia. And so now while here in America in the public school system, the government, they're kicking Christ out and running him off and doing everything they can to get rid of him. Here we have the Russians over there who've been under communism and atheism all this time embracing the, uh, the Christian, uh, creating a Christian holiday. Now, let me say this about the Russian Orthodox Church. Just like the Greek Orthodox Church, just like the Catholic Church, just like the Baptist Church, just like the Methodist Church, just like all the rest of them. Any organized, created, man-made religion is going to have its problems. Believe me. Believe me. But you cannot stand up and condemn everybody in that church just because it's got its problems. Because there is, no doubt in my mind, within these churches, people who are real believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Real believers. They embrace Him. While on the other hand, the official position of their church sometime can be one of the sorriest, low-down things you ever saw in your life. Now, folks, if you don't know, if you don't know what I'm talking about this morning, and before you jump up and start defending the Baptist church in this country, you better go around and take a good check at what's going on in Baptist churches right now. Right now. We got Baptist churches in this town that deny the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the death, burial, and resurrection, salvation by grace through faith, the inspiration of the scriptures, and they got Baptists hanging on their doors. They sure do. They got Baptists hanging on their doors. Yet, do we have anybody in this house that's born again? Did God get you before the Baptist did? Hallelujah. So do I believe that there are people in the Russian Orthodox Church that are born again? Absolutely. Do I believe the Russian Orthodox Church per se as a unit is a good representative of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, they've got a lot of problems. Same with the Greek Orthodox, same with the Catholic and the rest of them. It's, it's getting to the point now where religion is, so, is such a mishmash, messed up thing. It's a shame and a disgrace and abomination at what goes on. But he has his believers. He has his believers. So church polity is a... Is a is a, the local assembly should be a self-governing body of believers. Govern yourselves. You get a tyrant in the pulpit, throw him out. Some churches have a uh, have a uh, hierarchy to where they don't even have that. They can't even vote on their pastor. Their pastor is elected. He's he's appointed by the hierarchy. He's sent to that church. He stays there for a while. He's moved somewhere else. So instead of the people, the body of Christ, the local assembly. Choosing who their pastor is, they got a bunch of men sitting up here somewhere 100, 500, 1,000 miles away picking their pastor. That's ridiculous. It makes a lick of sense. That's control, folks. And some churches, when you take up an offering, instead of the offering going into that local assembly, that offering, every dime of that offering goes to the hierarchy. Then the hierarchy, in turn, disperses the money out to the people. Not so, folks. Ought not be so. I believe in a self-governing, autonomous, local assembly of believers. We share faith. We share agreement with our sister churches around here. There are plenty of churches in this town, in this East Tennessee, that love the Lord and good people, no question. Fine pastors. No doubt in my mind whatsoever about it. I know a bunch of them. 
But the truth of the matter is they, influ- they exercise no influence over us. They don't tell us how to, to do things in here. That keeps corruption down. If one church gets corrupted and false doctrine starts coming into that church, another church can say, no, I'm sorry, you got messed up somewhere. But if that starts coming down from a hierarchy and it's sent out in their literature and they begin to teach it in the churches, you see how that one source, one head of poison can be distributed to the rest of them. That's why I believe in autonomy. And then finally, the clergy and the layman. And I'm not a clergyman. What are you? I'm a born-again believer who happens to be a bishop. And bishop's a good term. I've never heard a Baptist called a bishop. I don't know why. It's a good term. I'd never criticize a man for calling a, a pastor a bishop. That's a scriptural term. But for some reason, Baptists just shy away from some terms. Maybe it's because they've been misused, abused, what have you. As a pastor of a local assembly, I'm a bishop, according to the Scripture, 1 Timothy 3. And that's, that's just the Bible term. I'm also a pastor, uh, uh, also a hard head, uh, 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 blind about a few things, uh, you know, uh, whatever. Lord knows. Uh, the truth of the matter is, he does not take some great inspirational head, some wonderful man, that people can just think, man, I just wish I was like. He takes an old junkyard dog and he puts him up in front of people and says, look what I did for that low-down stinking scumbag and see what I've done with him and how I'm using him and I can do the same for you. You say, that's a terrible attitude to have. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you ever followed anybody around for 24 or 7 for about a month, have you ever heard the old axiom that familiarity breeds contempt? Is there anybody in this house that would want somebody to follow them 24-7? <laughs> I mean, what if you got a little mad about something, you know? And you, didn't, you weren't real pious and holy and religious for a few minutes. <laughs> you know, got mad. Well, here's the bottom line. The term clergyman, there is a term in Greek, kleros, kleros. And that kleros in Greek is not translated clergy, but I guess that's where they borrow that from. I'm not sure about that. But clergy is a created office. You see, there's an awful lot when it comes to religion that we've, that we've got in baggage. I just have to con- confess to it. Really, I really do. There's a lot of baggage that comes along. And, and the term clergyman and layman is an is a arbitrary creation to classify and, and, and put people in certain areas and to give authority to a certain group. Now, the Catholic Church is big on it. They've been big on it. And the reason they're big on it is because that for centuries they kept the people illiterate. And the Mass was held in Latin. And there's nothing wrong with Latin. The fact is, Latin's a good language to study because it's the mother of about four or five different languages. Nothing wrong with Latin, but they held, they had the mass in Latin. And so the truth of the matter is, you know, I mean, here we are, we're in a foreign country, and the people don't understand Latin, so they didn't understand the thing that was being said. So the truth is that they focused everything on the man that was doing it. See, it was all focused on the man. And therefore the man took upon himself an arbitrary distinction as priest. That distinction as priest was taken out of the New Testament context, taken out of completely out of context, where he created for himself a carryover from the Old Testament priesthood into the New Testament and took elements of the Old Testament priesthood and created a New Testament priest class that did not exist. It does not exist in the Bible. But he did that. And the reason they did that is because they could exercise control over the people. So they do it in a number of ways. That's one way. Keep the people ignorant is another way. When they started printing Bibles in Great Britain was one of the first places. Now, now, uh, uh, German, uh, Martin Luther, he did too. He was an educated monk, got saved. And when he got saved, he saw the need immediately. When Martin Luther got saved, he saw the need right off the bat. To get, the lang- to get the Bible into the hands of the people in their own language because he realized that they were, they, they were kept in ignorance. All right, first thing you have to do is be able to read. Then you, have to be able to, then you have to have handed to you what you can read in your own language. That's the whole idea of the Word of God. Okay, so Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. And thank God for him. 
And the, king, and the Bible that Martin Luther translated is about 99% verbatim with that book. The reason it is is because he went to the same source. The difference is 50 men translated that book into English. But now before they did, Wycliffe, back in the 1300s, translated the Bible into English. And do you know what they did with him? When he died, they dug his body up and burned it in effigy and condemned him to the fires of hell forever. And what was his sin? His sin was to take the Bible and put it into the language of the people so they could have in their hands the Word of God and read it for themselves. And once that happens, the control is gone. My people are destroyed or controlled for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is expensive, folks. No man knows everything, but it's very expensive to be ignorant. And so when the Word of God was put into their hands, things began to change. Savannah Rolla started preaching. Martin Luther started preaching, translated the Bible. You have these, like Wycliffe and them, who started the movement. What, you, what came of it? What came of all of that? The Protestant Reformation. Exactly. They, they, they rebelled against Rome. So the idea of a clergy and a laity is a created thing to drive division among the people to classify one group over here as subservient and ignorant and another group over here as the rulers and masters over these people. And people still use it today and don't get mad at them. They use it because they've heard it and 95% of everything people say because they heard somebody else say it. How many of you agree with that? Have you agreed that there are very few people who will ever take the time to go and dig into detail and research what they've heard to find out if there's any truth in it? They won't do it. So the clergy and the laity, and there's good men in this town. I know them. I would not, I'm not going to mention any names. They're constantly referring to the laity. He's a layman. He's a clergyman, so forth and so on. It's a bunch of junk. There's no such thing. We are all priests. Every one of us are priests. The Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest. His priesthood is not after Aaron because Aaron was a priest to Israel. His priesthood is after Melchizedek. Melchizedek. His priesthood is after a king priest who showed up long before Levi did. He showed up 1,900 years before Christ. He's a mysterious priest. We don't even know where he came from. The book of Hebrews tells you plainly he had no descent. He's a, he's a remarkable being. And people, somebody says he's this, somebody says he's that, some say he's Shem, some say he's the Lord who showed up back then, all that. I'm not going to argue with people over that. Uh, but the bottom line is, it was Melchizedek that Abraham paid tithe to, and it is the priesthood of Melchizedek that the Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest of. And we are priests. The Bible says in Second Peter that we are a royal priesthood. The reason we are, because we are the sons of a king. And we are a royal priesthood. How many of us are? Every last one of us. And the sacrifices we offer is not the sacrifice of the Mass, the constant bloody sacrifice week after week after week. He offered one sacrifice forever for the sins of mankind. He doesn't need to repeat it. It doesn't need to be done again. It was done perfectly the first time. The blood was offered upon the altar. The Bible says he entered in one time with his own blood in the presence of God. He didn't enter in with his death. He didn't enter in with his life. He didn't enter in with anything representing anything. He took his own blood in the presence of God. Amen. And there he sprinkled it upon the altar. God smelled a sweet sacrifice, a savor, received his son, received him and to his presence the God-man who dared walk into the very presence of God with his own righteousness. Boy, what a thing. I'm out of time. That's quite a thing. That's one of the most remarkable things in the whole Bible. That a man who lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth had the kind of righteousness where he could walk into the presence of a righteous, holy God. And he was accepted. Whew. Brother Valance dismisses.